Greetings, not from Siberia, but from the great state of Idaho. And before anyone gets any crazy ideas, no, we, we have not fled the country. We are going back on the 2nd of April. Uh, but while I'm here in the States, I wanted to do a few video updates on my uh, English YouTube channel. I've been doing some presentations in different churches, some just letting people know what, we're, what we've been up to the last five or six years. And so I hope to get some of those videos, some of my sermons uploaded while I'm still here in the States. But this particular video was a video that I found in my library when I was cleaning my phone and realized that I have a long-term time standing debt to pay, uh, both to all of you <laughs> and to the person uh, who I will be interviewing in the video that you are about to watch. A uh, good friend of mine, Joseph Gleason from Russia, uh, formerly from America, he converted to Orthodoxy several years ago, Russian Orthodoxy, and then uh, subsequently moved himself and his whole family over to Russia. Before you get any, any other ideas, no, I have not converted to Russian Orthodoxy, but I do believe that the scripture tells us to strive for the unity of the faith and un giving uh, people of different denominations, different strains of Christianity, the time of day to present their case, try to understand what we can understand from them, uh, use what we can use from them, uh, as the old Russian saying goes, when you eat meat, spit out the bones, that kind of thing. So this is a, an interview with uh, Father Joseph Gleason, and I hope that it can be beneficial to you uh, in your walk with the Lord and just maybe uh, opening up some horizons for you, what's out there uh, in the great family of faith, which is uh, the Christian faith, the camp of Christ. So with no further ado, just... Uh, interview with Father Joseph Gleason. Greetings from Siberia! I know it's been like forever since my last video and I'm really sorry for that, but I have the opportunity. A very interesting person just showed up on the farm, just out of the blue, just showed up. <laughs> and that's, that happens a lot here. So, uh, and I just thought it's a great time to get a little bit of an interview and talk to him. Uh, this is Father Joseph Gleason, uh, formerly from the United States, currently from Russia, and he's got a very interesting story, so I'll just, with no further ado, I'm going to jump into it and uh, ask him a few questions and see what he has to say. So, first of all, we're really glad to have you here, and it was a uh, surprise uh, in a good way when Steve said, oh, I'm coming out to visit, can I bring Father Joseph with me? And I was like, yeah, sure, because uh, <laughs> unbeknownst to you, I've been meaning to actually get a hold of you at some point when I go to Moscow and do a meeting like this, some kind okay. of interview. It was like, aha! <laughs> As the Russians say, the prey comes to the hunter. <laughs> Glad to be so, here, and, and you should pray. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so you are originally from the U.S. Where from in the United States? Um, pretty much all of them. I uh, uh -huh. was born in Kansas. Uh, first few years in Ozark, Missouri, Southern Missouri area. Several years in Texas. Several years in Illinois. But my whole childhood. My uh, parents were gospel singers and, and missionaries, so they would go like church to church to church all over the U.S., singing in different churches, selling record albums, preaching the gospel. So I kind of grew up in every town. <laughs> yeah, and you said something about the Nazarene church. You, that's what your first folks yeah, were affiliated with? my dad was an Nazar uh, ordained Nazarene minister, mm -hmm. and uh, he was also you know gospel pianist, played for the Blackwood Brothers, Jubilee Quartet, recorded a bunch of songs. So, mm -hmm. so the, the first thing, of course, that just like jumps out at you is like, uh, priest, Father Joseph, Russian Orthodox priest. So how did that happen? You go from, you know, raised in the church, in the Protestant church, mm -hmm. raised in the Nazarene, you know, preaching, going with the family, all that kind of stuff, sure, uh, sure. to, you know, becoming a Russian Orthodox priest. <laughs> yeah, well, it didn't happen overnight. You know? mm -hmm. I wasn't like 12 and just thought, hey, I think I'll become an Orthodox priest someday, you know. Um, but yeah, just raised up in that way. And then as an adult, you know, got married wife and I started having kids. We have eight of them now. Um, but we are, already had several kids. I had already become, um, at the time, I was a, a, a pastor in an Anglican church. I was a deacon and was moving towards the priesthood in an Anglican church. Um, and so, you know, still in the Protestant sphere, but I'd gotten a little more into, like, you know, the ancient faith and liturgy and, and these kinds of things, reading some of the church fathers and writings from the early church. Dangerous thing to do. <laughs> yeah. You might find out what the apostles taught their disciples, and it can be surprising to some people. But um, anyway, I was doing this, and you know, it's a story I'm sure you've heard before, and you know, we've, we've talked outside of this, but uh, just started realizing, you know, what did people pray like in the second century, in the third century? You know, 
the the disciples of the apostles you know people that studied you know people like ignatius you know people that <laughs> studied under the apostle paul under the apostle peter um <clears throat> polycarp who studied under the apostle john how did they see the faith how how did they receive the faith and <clears throat> I also got to thinking, you know, there weren't any Nazarenes back in like the 1200s. You know, mm. if I were alive on earth in the year, you know, 750 or the year 500, uh, there weren't any Presbyterian churches I could go to. And so mm. I, I just started thinking, hmm, you know, and... If you took a time machine, where do you go to church? Yeah, that, that kind of question, exactly. In fact, I've asked people that if you took a time machine back a thousand years and, you know, you, you set up a little homestead, set up a little mm. farm or moved into a village, get a job doing something... You know, are you going to go to church? Well, of course. You know, I'm a mm -hmm. Christian. I believe in Christ. Okay, where are you going to go? Mm -hmm. And that narrows down your options because most options today didn't even exist mm -hmm. for much of history. And and so it was a long process, you know, many stacks of books on, you know, every possible side, Catholic, Orthodox, Baptist, Presbyterian, <laughs> Anglican, everything. And, you know, for various reasons, each of which would be a long rabbit trail, you know, going down. Uh, my family and I studied it. We, we were you know, reading the scriptures. I was fasting. I was praying. And uh, we came to the conclusion that we wanted to, we wanted to be Orthodox Christians, which was interesting because at the time we were living in southern Illinois and the nearest Orthodox church was like over like an hour and 15 minutes mm -hmm. one way just to get there. So it wasn't something just right in our backyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was something we had to go a ways to find. But we decided to go that route. And even then, I wasn't thinking, oh, you know, I've, I've got to become a priest. I've got to, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, but for many years in my life, I've at least had the intention. Now, I've, I've failed to follow through a hundred times, but I've had the intention to follow Christ wherever that, you know, wherever mm -hmm. he leads, to obey Christ no matter what he says. And sometimes it ends up being things that I expect, some things it ends up being things that I, I like. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a surprise. You know, you turn to that passage of Scripture, like, what? It, it, it says that? I have to do that? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I wasn't raised Orthodox. I wasn't raised with robes and incense and icons and all that kind of thing. But I was taught by my parents from a very early age that you follow Christ. You mm -hmm. obey Christ. You do what he says. And... So my family and I, we felt that to do that, we needed to, to become Orthodox. And then years later, um, I, did, I did become a priest. How many years ago did that happen, did that, that moment where you decided to go to become Orthodox? So, when, when was that? Uh, well, you remember the whole housing crash mm -hmm. in 2008? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of businesses were laying off people by the dozens. So I was a computer engineer at the time, mm -hmm. uh, doing IT work for Anheuser-Busch, mm -hmm. of all places. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it was 2008, you know. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've slept since then. But, uh, <laughs> but I was doing IT work for them in St. Louis, and that job disappeared, along mm -hmm. with, you know, thousands and thousands of others. And uh, so it's funny, over about the next year or so, my cousin and I sold Salad Master pots and pans. You know, did all these dinner <laughs> shows. And, hey, you, you know, you feed your family, working, doing yeah, you can what do. you can do. That's right. And so I was listening to Zig Ziglar and... You know, but, uh, and then I got another computer job later. But anyway, in that time that I wasn't just go, 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 you know, to a computer job doing that, I had all this time on my hands to, to read, <laughs> which can be dangerous, you mm -hmm. know. And so I was reading more books on theology, more books on scripture, more books on history of the church and things like this. And, and started thinking that, um, I, I wanted to be a part of the ancient Christian faith. Mm -hmm. you know, how, however Christ and the apostles started it, that's what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if, you're, if you grew up in the West, if you grew up in America, one of the first things you think of is Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And then if you were raised the way I was, you're like, Catholicism? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm still studying this, but there, you know, these kind of mm -hmm. fighting, you know, these tendencies fighting against each other. And then I was also reading about orthodoxy and some other things. And, um, so yeah, that process started late 2008, early 2009, mm -hmm. and I think it was, so fast forward a few months, I think it was September 2009 that we attended our first, uh, Orthodox liturgy. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned again that your, your folks were active in the church, mm -hmm. the Protestant church. In yeah, yeah. How did they react to your choice to 
leave the faith, right? I mean, change the faith. How do you, how, how do they see that and how do they react? How yeah. Is their reaction? Well, uh, yeah, unfortunately my dad, uh, he passed away in 2007. Mm. Um, so, you know, that wasn't, that a, wasn't, a, that wasn't an a issue at that issue. point. You know, my mom and my sister, they were not, they were not very pleased. They were not happy with it. Um, <clears throat> you know, my sister looked at it as, you know, you've gone off into paganism, you've gone, gone off into idolatry. Um, and you know, I really press, you know, you need to be looking at the ancient church and you look at how the apostles taught their disciples and they started looking down that road, but they were so sure that the answer couldn't be orthodoxy mm -hmm. that they ended up going for a while off into a non-Trinitarian Messianic Jewish mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. which I was like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, not the intended, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not the intended gonna... results. <laughs> right. and, and my mom, she hated it. And so now my, my cousin, I did have you know a cousin who, who followed us into orthodoxy and we were in the church together, but it was, you know, it was pretty tense. It was, mm -hmm. uh, um, my mom didn't like it. My sister didn't like it. You know, didn't really want to come visit our church. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, a few years later I moved my family to Russia mm -hmm. and, you know, my sister was okay with that. She, she had done some traveling and she was kind of open-minded to mm -hmm. international moves, but uh, my mom, she took it personally. She didn't understand our faith aspect mm -hmm. and what we were trying to accomplish uh, at the time. She felt like we were moving away from her, mm -hmm. which was not the intention at all. I love my mother. I love to spend time with her. I want her to be around the grandkids, but we had our reasons that we wanted to move to Russia. And so she was very upset. And, mm -hmm. and so it was a combination of things. You know, you've changed this different faith. You've moved to Russia. And so she just decided that she hated orthodoxy. And she hated Russia, mm -hmm. just <laughs> right, right. both with the equal fervor. <laughs> that's terrible. And so, you know, initially, you know, those first few years, that's kind of how it went. <clears throat> now, through a couple of interesting stories, uh, eventually, uh, my sister and her family decided to become Orthodox. Mm. Years, you know, years later. Down the road. Mm -hmm. And this made my mom even more upset. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, now, now you too, not you. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were on the same team. And then... Uh, now it's been a couple of years ago. My mom became Orthodox and now everything's fine. Mm. So, <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. So, so really... she hated, 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 hated. Mm. And then she became Orthodox and it's a Russian Orthodox church in Texas. Mm -hmm. and, and now she, she's like, Oh, okay. You guys, it's, it's all right. So. All right. So <laughs> we're going to get to the talk about the move to Russia, but sure. Just stay here for a minute. Talking about America. The, the, like, if you could just read her's digest version of the, 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 the number one biggest benefit of mm -hmm. being Russian Orthodox in America? What would you say for yourself, your own feeling of that? Like what's the, the, the main thing you gained as a Russian Orthodox, converted to Russian Orthodoxy in the United States? Sure, well, it, <clears throat> interestingly enough, when I was in the US, I actually did not convert to Russian Orthodoxy. Mm. Um, I joined an Antiochian Orthodox church. Mm. And uh, you know, if you're Orthodox, you hear all these terms, you know, Serbian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all these things. Um, if you're not Orthodox, you know, it's like, what are these different religions, different denominations? What mm -hmm. is this? And so the Reader's Digest answer to that would just be, you know, even in the very early church, you know, the apostles went out to all these different lands, preached the gospel. And so it's the same faith going to every land. You know, Peter's mm -hmm. not preaching a different gospel from Paul, mm -hmm. uh, from Thomas, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so the same gospel is being preached in the first century in um <clears throat> in Greece and England and Rome and so on. And so nevertheless, you know, the apostles were setting up different, you know, overseers, you mm -hmm. know, uh, bishops in these different places. And so just for administrative purposes, if you're over in Greece, you're going to have a Greek bishop. Mm -hmm. If you're in Rome, you're going to have an Italian bishop. I'm oversimplifying mm -hmm. and, you know, not going into great detail, but so these, so it grows up like this. And so over time you end up with, the Russian Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. and the Greek Orthodox Church, and the Serbian Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. and then in Syria, you know, we call it the Antiochian Orthodox Church, named after the town of Antioch, right. which is mentioned in the Bible. True. In fact, Christians were, were they first, first called, called Christians, Christians in Antioch. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the Antiochian Orthodox loved that verse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but yeah, that's where the word Christian was first coined, and. And so it's not different denominations, it's not different faiths or different teachings. They're teaching the same doctrines mm -hmm. in the Antiochian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, and so on. 
the the national adjective on there is just to let you know you know where's your bishop from you know mm -hmm. where, where do you guys come from because the music's a little different mm -hmm. you know maybe the robes look a little different you know it's nothing of doctrinal significance but there are little you know little differences in how things run mm -hmm. so i was in an antiochian orthodox church um in america and of course whenever later when i moved to russia you're going to be Russian Orthodox because that's the kind of orthodoxy that's mm -hmm. here. But it's the same faith. Uh, but to get to your question, you know, how did becoming Orthodox, you know, what benefits are there? You know, why do it? Uh, the reason I converted my wife, our children, and ultimately my cousin, my mom, my sister, and my aunt and my uncle became Orthodox. Um, we just looked at it and there's all these different churches all claiming to be you know, apostolic, Christian, biblical, you know, all these different words. Uh, but it's everybody picking up their Bible and saying, well, here's what I think this means. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, here's what I think that means. And if you get 10 different guys with 10 different Bibles, you're going to get 11 different opinions on what mm -hmm. the Bible means in, in many different cases. And we just started asking, you know, kind of like you mentioned earlier, you know, if you got in the time machine, went back to the year 700, mm -hmm. what church would you go to? Uh, we started asking, okay. What did Jesus and the apostles actually teach people to believe and to do mm -hmm. back in the first century and early second century? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the faith that was passed on? You know, is it is it Presbyterian? You know, I can't find a whole lot of Presbyterian churches in mm -hmm. the history books in the second century. You know, so if Presbyterianism is what was being taught, the disciples must have done a terrible job of teaching it because I can't find any mm -hmm. example of that. You know, same thing with uh, Lutheran church, you know, mm -hmm. you don't find a lot of Lutheran churches in second century Rome, you know. And so we went back and just said, you know, let's, let's read the scriptures. Uh, let's read these writings by men like Polycarp and Ignatius who studied under the apostles and learned mm -hmm. the faith from the apostles. You know, what did Ignatius write? What did Polycarp write? Mm -hmm. uh, what did Irenaeus write? These different early mm -hmm. church Christians. And we're just looking for the answer. What was the faith passed down from Christ and the apostles? Because whatever that is, the question isn't whether I like it or not. The question mm -hmm. is, do I want to be with Christ or not? Do I want to do mm -hmm. what he says to do? And that's what we're looking for. So we felt the benefit is, okay, we're doing, you know, we are following the faith according to the way that Christ and the apostles passed it down. That's mm -hmm. the, the benefit is to be in alignment with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, any other benefit may or may not be there, but it would be irrelevant because mm -hmm. if you're with Christ, you get everything. Mm -hmm. If you're not, <laughs> you don't. So mm -hmm. we want to be following Christ. That's, that's the real, that's the benefit. Sure. Sure. Uh, that begs a question here as, you know, we, we look at the, the Christian world in general mm -hmm. and like the Protestant Christian world, sure. especially and how just absolutely fractured it is. It's not just that, and none of us think that's a good you know, thing. Thousands right. of denominations sure. and you know everything. And if someone's got a conflict with their pastor, they just go knock down their own and open a new church. Unfortunately, and, like, yeah. and no one thinks that's that's good. But that sure. is, uh, unfortunately, one of the results of the kind of idea that that the Reformation brought and the Protestantism understood. Had. So, but it, how is that fundamentally different from the Orthodox world, where, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, Constantinople and Russia and Moscow are not in communion at the moment, mm -hmm. and you know Rome and um, Constantinople excommunicate each other, like, oh, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, and mm -hmm. how is how is that fundamentally different from the 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 fracturing of the, that we see in the Protestant world? Now that's a very good question, a very fair question. So, um. And really, I think what we so easily do is we look at, okay, how are things today? This, mm -hmm. is what we, this is what we're tempted to do, whether you're Protestant or Orthodox or Catholic, for that matter. You look at how are things today? And, okay, well, let me read the Bible, and you know, here's what I think. And if you take that approach, whether you're starting from a Protestant presupposition or mm -hmm. an Orthodox, um, you're just going to get different opinions. You're going to get different ideas about here's what this means to me. Mm -hmm. And and you're going to end up with, okay, I'm going to move six blocks down the street and start my own mm -hmm. new, you know, first apostolic church that's never existed before. <laughs> that's just like Paul really taught, you know, what right, Paul right, really right, said, right, church, right. you know. The, the, first, the first apostolic church of the self-anointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 
first self righteous church in Pasadena, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so, how do you avoid that? I think if that way of framing the question so consistently leads to that fruit, you know, mm -hmm. but Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them, mm -hmm. that doesn't it just apply to people, but to questions. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have to repent of our questions, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and say, okay, and just go back and say, what really happened? How did things begin? What, what was at the root? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might, this path looks nice, this path looks nice, this path looks nice. Well, how do you pick which one of the three? Well, sometimes you have to literally walk all the way back to where there was a fork in the road and see which way the signs point, <laughs> mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and so those things are confusing. Those things are kind of hard to wrestle out. To be honest, I don't even know that they are that different. I don't think, by definition, I don't think the Orthodox Church or the Catholics or any Protestant denomination is free from the possibility of fracturing. Mm -hmm. You go all the way back to Jesus himself and we most of us can agree he was a pretty good leader you know he was <laughs> he knew what he was doing not bad yeah <laughs> got in human form and all that let's just, let's, <laughs> let's just say that whatever happened there we're not going to improve on it mm -hmm. he had Judas yeah and Judas went a different path right. than what Jesus said to go and what the other apostles went uh the 70 apostles mm -hmm. that Jesus sent out uh, in church history, we find out that four of those seventy according to tradition, yeah, yeah that mm -hmm. four of those went the wrong way. Right, uh, the seven deacons in Acts, you know, mm -hmm. the seven first deacons. Mm -hmm. One of them was Nicholas, mm -hmm. from which we get the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans. which I yep. hate in Revelation, <laughs> yes. right? Yeah, and so even Peter and Paul, both wonderful guys, mm -hmm. guys that we want to follow, and they even kind of knocked heads a little bit there <laughs> in mm -hmm. Scripture, you know, yeah, because Peter kind of, you know, he was kind of slipping a little bit, and Paul mm -hmm. had to. Uh, confront him to his face and say, hey, you know, you got to stop this. This isn't right. This yeah. isn't in line with the gospel. And so I don't think we should be scared of that and say, oh, there was a schism here. This bad thing happened. That couldn't be the true faith. Mm -hmm. We should say this has been going on for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's always been schisms. Jesus even says in Scripture, you know, God teaches in Scripture that there must be divisions among you to show who's approved. Um, if you have the truth and then you have not the truth, there's going to be tension, there's going to be fighting, and eventually those two are going to split, mm -hmm. and then you'll still have truth and not the truth. Mm -hmm. you just got to identify which is which. And so, you know, absolutely, in the Orthodox Church, you go back to the 1600s in Russia, there was a horrible schism. Mm -hmm. You know, old believers, and yep. do you sign yourself with two fingers or three fingers, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> all these things. Uh, go back to 5th century Egypt, and you've got the Coptics, non-Chalcedonians, you know, and yep. schism with all the rest of us, which now has become... You know, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant, mm -hmm. and then there's the Coptics on this whole different branch, the yep. historians. So, schisms have been going on. You know, since the early centuries, people have been breaking away, teaching wrong things. So, fundamentally, I would say it's not different. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, today you mentioned uh, Constantinople and Russia. Um, I'm not going to bore all of your <laughs> viewers by explaining the whole thing, sure. what's going on, but just from my perspective, looking at it. Um, I think it's pretty easy to go back through Orthodox history, look at what Orthodox bishops have taught for centuries, mm -hmm. and show that what uh, Patriarch Bartholomew is doing is a totally different, new thing. He's trying to become his own pope, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, presuming I'm going to rule over the entire Orthodox world. Well, that's that's what the Pope of Rome did, mm -hmm. and that's how you know Rome used to be a uh, part of the Orthodox Church a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And then their bishop decided he's the king of the whole world. And we're like, uh, no, buddy, you know, <laughs> sorry, we, we mm -hmm. respect you, we like you, but it's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. Only king of the whole world is Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we do have bishops, we do have deacons, priests, patriarchs, but um, it, the only one who rules the entire worldwide church mm -hmm. is Christ himself, mm -hmm. not one man other sure. than Christ. And so, in you know, the way I see it, Bartholomew is doing the same thing today that the popes of Rome did a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's resulting in the same thing. We have this big split, this big schism, these fights going on theologically. And it's because somebody has decided to sin, somebody has decided to turn their back on Christ. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with Russian Orthodoxy or Serbian Orthodoxy or Antiochian Orthodoxy. Uh, it just means that, you know, sometimes men get into power and then they sin. Mm -hmm. And it causes mm -hmm. bad things to happen. Mm -hmm. And so it just takes discernment to look at it and say, 
do I care enough about the truth mm -hmm. to do my homework, mm -hmm. to read the history, to read the theology, to read the scriptures, to fast, to pray, mm -hmm. um, and to actually figure out where should I be standing? Mm -hmm. You know, which side is truth, which side is false? The reason it's so difficult for a lot of people to find the truth is because they're not looking. Mm -hmm. Or they're looking, but they're looking kind of like this. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say, look around and you'll find. Mm -hmm. He said, seek. seek. Yep. And to seek, I'm not just going to go like this. I'm going to go, you know, tear the insulation off your walls and look behind it. I'm going to lift up the curtains. I'm going to look under the chair and I'm going to, you know, open every book and open every page until I find, ah, here's where you hid that $5 bill. Mm -hmm. If I seek for that $5 bill, I'm going to find it. Mm -hmm. If I just look like this, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And for truth, you have to seek for it. You have to want it. It has to be something that you thirst after, hunger after. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say those that faintly desire the truth and righteousness, you know, that they'll be filled. He says those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to want it. Yep. You've got to want it bad. But if you want it bad, I think it's there to be found. I think you can take the time to look at what Bartholomew is teaching, you know, Constantinople Patriarch. Take the time to look at what Russian Orthodoxy and most of the Orthodox world is teaching. See that there's a difference and identify one as false and the mm. other as historical and true and, and holy. Mm. And I think you can do this with any other theological argument. It just it takes work, yeah. and, and most people don't want to do that. All right, so aside from the reasons, like mm -hmm. why, like you said, you, you want to be oriented with the ancient faith, you want to be right. oriented with Christ. Aside from that, when you guys, when your family, because you already had a family, you had a yeah. you know, wife, Multiple children. Multiple kids, yeah. Yeah, and you moved from, you know, going to, being in communion with the Protestant church and, mm -hmm. and, and be converting to orthodoxy yeah. and moving into that. How did that that move what was the personal effect for you on mm -hmm. that? like just for you and for your family aside from the the theological question of you know what you so we decided to do that now what are the results what's right the fruit exactly of that? what do you what do you what did you feel when you were still living in the states i saw a number of things um one i still am i'm sure to a certain extent but i definitely was a very hard and and proud and in some cases, just not a very nice person. Mm. Uh, I, I really, for years, I just felt like I was God's gift to you know the world with theology. I, I you know, knew the Bible backwards. I thought I knew the back, Bible backwards and forwards. Um, I had God all figured out. I had the faith all figured out, and I could explain it to you. And it doesn't matter if I was 20 and you were 50 and you'd been reading the Bible your whole life. Mm. I knew all the answers. And... Uh, and I wasn't even necessarily wrong about everything I believed at the time, but even the stuff I was right about, I was kind of arrogant. <laughs> and one thing that orthodoxy, if you're following it seriously, pounds into you from day one is, is just to get rid of your pride. Mm -hmm. Humble yourself before God and your brother mm -hmm. and your wife and your children. Mm -hmm. And... Um, like and, and continuously hitting on it, not just like once in a while mentioning that pride's a bad thing and yeah you should mm -hmm. avoid it, but like like no I'm I'm proud, mm -hmm. you know I'm arrogant I I need to I need to be silent more, mm -hmm. um, I need to actually ask other people to forgive me, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it, all these things that I had never heard before like like don't even trust your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that? I mean, mm -hmm. practically, how do you do that? Because you have to decide something. Mm -hmm. You know, your your toilet breaks down. You have to decide, am I going to call this guy or that guy? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll call the guy that's a plumber. Mm -hmm. Well, you just made a decision. You're trusting your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, same thing in theology. You have to decide, am I going to follow the Pope? Am mm -hmm. I going to just pick up my Bible and read it alone and that's it? Am I going to follow, you know, Orthodox tradition and the mm -hmm. teachings of the bishops? Well, how do I not trust my own thoughts? Because I have to make a decision. I'm just a... You know, <laughs> um, God didn't send an angel that I can visibly look at and say, mm -hmm. okay, tell me what I'm supposed to do here. Mm -hmm. And so, and so there's this, this, these two different ways of making a decision. One is, you know, to hold yourself up and say, you know, I'm the expert. I really mm -hmm. know. I've studied everything and I know the right way to do electricity. And I know the right way to do plumbing and I know the right way to do publishing. I know the right, you know. Act like I know everything about everything. Mm -hmm. um, 
that takes a really high level of expertise and years of study to, if you're going to get that good at that many different things. But it takes a lot less effort to be smart enough to say, look, I don't know anything about plumbing, mm -hmm. but I know how to identify a good plumber. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about electricity, but I know how to call an electrician. You know, not some guy that's been goofing around in his basement and has figured out how to mm -hmm. <laughs> do some interesting things with wires, but the guy that knows electricity and can really do it right. right. And so I think that's kind of the, the difference when when we say don't trust your own thoughts. It's not saying stop thinking and just, mm -hmm. just sit there until God moves you to go do mm -hmm. something. But it's just realizing sin you know, has pervaded the universe. Mm. It's pervaded not just our flesh, you know, which is dying, but it's pervaded our our brain, uh, our thoughts. You know, every part of us mm -hmm. has been affected. I'm not going to say destroyed, but every part of us has been affected by sin, which means even when I'm trying to make a logical decision, when I'm just trying to weigh evidence and be, mm -hmm. be logical, mm -hmm. um, even that process has been affected by sin. Mm -hmm. And just to admit that, mm -hmm. there's a certain level of humility just in admitting that and saying, huh, here's this data, here's this data. I might not be very good at figuring out which is better and which mm -hmm. is worse. Just to admit that, mm -hmm. you know, people, that's hard for a lot of people. It was mm -hmm. very hard for me. Uh, to say that maybe the conclusions I come to aren't always right. Maybe somebody else, maybe my wife is right about something. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe my next door neighbor is right and I just can't see it. Mm -hmm. Maybe this thing that I've studied in the Bible a hundred times and I'm just, I, I can quote chapter and verse all these things. Maybe I'm in delusion. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm wrong are two of the most difficult words for the human lips to form mm -hmm. in any language. Mm -hmm. And um, what does that do? Just to take that one little step and say, I've looked at all this, I've looked at all that, and I might be wrong. What is that? How does that little bit of humility help a person? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you're at least not going to be closed, have your heart closed and your ears closed when another human being opens up his Bible, mm -hmm. <laughs> opens up his books of church history, mm -hmm. and says, well, but did you think of it this way? Mm -hmm. Did you think of it that way? And and sometimes it's not that the answer isn't clear. It's that we have already decided what the answer is before we heard the right one. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, maybe given these five options, we pick the best of the five. Mm -hmm. And then we've just settled. I know that's it. I know I'm right. I've, I've got all the evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. And I'm so confident in my ability to come to the right conclusion that finally the right answer comes along. Mm -hmm. which I never properly, you know, with the proper attitude considered, but I've already got things figured out. Mm -hmm. So I've already prejudged and decided I'm not going to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I had just had the humility to say, okay, this sure looks right to me, mm -hmm. but I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. uh, I've made bad decisions before. Right. I've done things that I knew were right. And, and now I look back and I say, man, I was, I was an idiot. Mm -hmm. What if I'm an idiot right now? <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. like to think, nobody wants to think that, but I, I can't tell you even today how often I, I wonder if I'm an idiot, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't ask people because I don't want to know what they <laughs> think the answer to that question is, but you know, I ask myself, you know, you know, is there something that I'm being deceived on now? Is mm -hmm. there something I'm not seeing right now? And it just makes me want to patiently and prayerfully at least look at you know, if somebody wants to show me something, you know, mm -hmm. have you looked at this in scripture? Have you looked at this in the teachings of the church fathers? Have you looked at how the apostles handled this situation? Mm -hmm. And I at least want to be humble enough to look at it and realize that maybe I don't know everything. Right. And just that constant, it, it's helped me in relationships, I'd say. So I, I was focused on the theology and that's super important, but that pounding into us of the need for humility has helped my relationship so much i used mm -hmm. to offend people um almost as a hobby you know <laughs> it was like mm -hmm. just constant i had i had become I don't, I don't know i don't know your theological leanings as far as calvinist versus arminian mm -hmm. and 
Uh, is there one of those two camps that you would fall in? <laughs> Probably more Armenian. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to know what if I was about to step in something, but <laughs> I, I was like a hardcore. I was raised Armenian, but then I, I became this hardcore, you know, nail nail biting <laughs> Calvinist. Yeah. So, so I spent several years as one of those, uh, and I was just horrible to be around. I mm. just um, having that hardened view of God's character, mm -hmm. which I think is a very deformed view now. But you become like what you worship. Mm -hmm. Well, I was worshiping God viewed through a certain twisted mm -hmm. lens, and I became harder as a, as a result. Mm -hmm. I thought he was hard, and so I became hard in the way that I would look at people. You know, yeah. I had less compassion, less patience. Uh, I had a sharp tongue. Right. Uh, I was haughty. I would mock people. I was just... I was. It's embarrassing. I was just, I was really a terrible person to be around. Mm. And, and then I became Orthodox mm. and humility, 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 right. which any Christian has to admit it's preached in scripture over and over yeah. and over. You know, pride's like the root of all sin. Right. So we kind of ought to focus on that. Yep. And the more I started repenting of my pride before God and at least maybe failing, but at least making an attempt at humility, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least trying not to be proud. Um, people started liking me better. Right. Uh, I started keeping friends better. Hmm. Um, people that used to not want to be around me, you know, many of whom were my relatives, mm -hmm. started thinking, "Oh, maybe uh, it's okay. It's okay to be around Joe right. now. He's all right." Um, so it, this healing started happening in like family relationships, friendships, mm -hmm. because I just wasn't a, being a jerk yeah. <laughs> anymore. Yeah. And now. And there, now there's a flip side to it. Anytime you convert to anything, you're usually a jerk for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. you're the cage stage yeah. you've heard of. Yeah. Um, so I went through that with, with orthodoxy. So there was a while there that I was just a jerk because I was a convert trying to make everybody else in the world mm -hmm. be like me. But, um, you know, by the grace of God, eventually you kind of... <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Um, <laughs> don't approach people in the same way yeah. after, after you yeah. kind of get through that and see that's not the way to be with people. Yeah, so you but, converted in 2009, mm -hmm. and then fast forward six years, 2015, you guys make decide you to make the decision to move to Russia. Move to Russia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, first of all, <clears throat> it doesn't look like Orthodoxy was originally connected with a desire to go to Russia. Not at all. Um, Not at all. I thought I'd but, live in America my whole life. Right. So then, how did the the 2015 move to Russia? How did that happen? It, yeah. You know? So, so there's this whole gradual thing. Um, at the time. I didn't see that I was moving in that direction mm -hmm. at all. Uh, in retrospect, I can see that there was a whole, you know, domino effect. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised on the same anti-Russia, anti-Soviet mm. propaganda that you everybody. were raised with. Yeah. Everybody, you know, everybody <laughs> in America in the West. You know, if you speak English and you were raised in the West, <laughs> yep. you know, you've seen, yep. you know, you've seen failsafe. You've seen. Um, you know, what's the one with Sean Connery? Um, Hunt for Red October. Right. You know all these right. different. You know Russian bad, America mm -hmm. good. You know patriotism, patriotism, patriotism. <laughs> um, in, in every movie, every Russian is brutal, mm -hmm. um, unless he's defecting to the United States. <laughs> and and in Russia, it's always dark. It's always cold. Right. There are right. no flowers. There is no sunlight in Russia. Right. You know. <laughs> and so. If all you've ever seen is propaganda in the movies, on the news, on TV, why would you believe anything else? Right. You don't have anything else to compare it with. And so, you know, when I first became Orthodox, if you said, okay, what's wonderful about Russia? I'd be like, oh, nothing, you know? Right, right. <laughs> uh, I was just ignorant. I knew nothing about Russia. Uh, and then, and if you're, if you're a Protestant, at least to the best of my knowledge, and I've been various flavors of Protestant, um, there's nothing in American Protestantism to counteract that anti-Russian propaganda. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you're just a Protestant, plus you have anti-Russian propaganda, because mm -hmm. that's just kind of the American ethos. But being Orthodox, I was exposed to all these amazing, awesome uh, Christian heroes of the past, mm -hmm. people who loved Christ with all of their hearts and lived for Christ and did amazing things for Christ and were Russians, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, they call them the saints, you know, use whatever title you like, but these were, these were holy men and women that tried to follow God and mm -hmm. tried to follow Christ. You know, you have 
Vladimir, Prince of Kiev, mm -hmm. who is this you know horrific, bloodthirsty pagan with tons of wives, and then he he converts to Orthodox Christianity, narrows it down to one wife, a uh, Christian wife, and and then you know in with true Viking blood, you know, he strongly encourages all of his <laughs> subjects to become Christians as well, mm -hmm. and many of them do. Many mm -hmm. of them follow their king into you know into becoming Christians, mm -hmm. which it's a great upgrade from worshiping trees and mm -hmm. worshiping Perun and mm -hmm. all these idols that they've carved into wood. Now, you know, in whatever form they had received it, they're Christians now. They're saying, "Hey, look, instead of the idols, let's burn those. Let's mm -hmm. drown those. Let's make the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go pray to Christ." let's fast let's pray you know these are good things mm -hmm. you know let's read the scriptures let's hear the preaching of scripture this is a good thing and and you have other guys you know alexander nevsky dmitry donskoy um as you know there's just there's thousands of these people mm -hmm. you know throughout the past thousand years um many of whom are martyrs you know countless thousands of martyrs for the faith that were their blood was spilled mm -hmm. on this soil in russia over the past hundred years and just to put it in perspective you know i, I noticed here on the shelf you've got fox's book of christian mm -hmm. martyrs and you know anybody that's been in missions you know i'm sure you know you've looked at people like uh uh what's elizabeth elliott's first husband uh, mm -hmm. jim jim elliott, jim elliott. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and you know how it's he was a, killed by the Aka Indians, yep. and just you, you get all these stories of people that just sacrificed everything they had, mm -hmm. and were willing to shed their blood for sure. Christ. And and we're I think as Christians we're supposed to have a certain awe and respect for that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take um, all of the people that shed their blood for Christ in Russia um, over the seventy-two years of communism, mm -hmm. that's more people than all the martyrs. Mm -hmm. In the whole world for the first 1900 years mm -hmm. since from the time of the church until bolshevism mm -hmm. there have been more martyrs shedding their blood in russia just over the past century mm. you know until the fall of communism 30 years ago mm -hmm. and and so being becoming orthodox i got exposed to this whole world of just amazing men and women of the faith people mm -hmm. who gave everything for christ people who would you know look directly at an atheist with a gun mm -hmm. and say no i i believe in christ mm -hmm. i believe god created man i, I don't i'm not an atheist mm -hmm. and would take a bullet to the head because they they did not want to deny christ mm -hmm. and you know and prior to that just centuries you know even if many of the russian rulers were fallible flawed made all kinds of mistakes it was at least an ideal mm -hmm. that was voiced in the russian empire yeah that this is a christian nation that our leaders should be christian that they should follow christ they should mm -hmm. be in church you know they would have special seats in churches for the czar mm -hmm. and his and his family um whether they succeed in being christian rulers or fail just that that it was the ideal mm -hmm. of the russian empire tells you something about russia mm -hmm. that there was a certain amount of taking christianity seriously Mm -hmm. uh, you know, America is not the first place in history that has had people trying to <laughs> do things according sure. to Christian principles. Mm -hmm. You know, you've had centuries of Russian leaders trying to do that, mm -hmm. and some of them succeeding. And so becoming Orthodox, I had my mind and my heart open to this whole history of Christianity in Russia, where I started seeing, man, there must be something good there. There must mm -hmm. be something holy. There must actually be people there. In fact, there demonstrably have been people there who love Christ with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. And so that gave me just a whole new perspective on Russia. Mm -hmm. And so that's like step one. And then how do I end up moving there? Well, just realizing it's a positive place with this thousand year Christian history. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, being grieved by a lot of the things I was seeing in America. I don't agree with America's foreign policy of... Mm -hmm putting military bases all over the world and, um, you know, overturning governments worldwide and setting up little petty, you know, <laughs> petty states. Um, I don't agree with that approach. I don't like that. Um, I saw how, you know, morality in America kept plummeting, how um, just the wider and wider acceptance of mm -hmm. the LGBT and the transgender and all this stuff. And it just started going through my mind just a hypothetical thing. And I started mm -hmm. talking to my wife and just said, you know, we're fine now. 
we might always be fine, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, the way things are going, mm -hmm. it's possible that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or maybe, you know, in our kids' time, mm -hmm. it's possible things could get so bad here for Christians mm -hmm. in America that we actually might need to look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And just hypothetically, if that were to happen, where would we go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just started, just as a mental exercise, I started looking at different places. I mm -hmm. looked at Chile, I looked at Paraguay, I looked at Uruguay, I looked at, you know, Mexico, Canada, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia, Africa. I looked just, just curious, you know, what, what are homeschooling laws like here and there? What are, uh, you know, what are the, you know, the gay marriage laws in different countries? And it's really interesting. I found... Because two things that are very close to my heart, one is homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God said, you, this is in Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 6, God says, you, yes. parents, teach your children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you rise up, when you right. go down, when you're out by the way, when you're coming. Basically, put, put in modern parlance, he says, in Deuteronomy 6, he says, whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whether you're outside or inside, whether you're waking up or going to sleep at night, yep. be teaching your children. Yes. And the thing that you're supposed to constantly be teaching your children primarily is the fear of God and the obedience to his commandments, right. and the love of God. And math, science, and all that other stuff is important, but it comes a sec mm -hmm. distant second. And God did not say, um, delegate your responsibilities to the government mm -hmm. so that they can teach your children while you go watch your soap operas and you go to the mall and right. do the stuff that you want to do. You know, God said, you teach your children. Right. You pass on the faith. You teach, you know, Psalm 78, I think it is. I might be off by one, but in the 70s, where God says, you know, to raise up your children in the Lord mm -hmm. uh, so that generations yet unborn right. will follow Christ. Yes. Or follow God. Follow God. Will follow God. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that Psalm just really grabbed me because here is an explicit place in Scripture that God gives the command that parents are to take responsibility yes. for whether your great, 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 great grandchildren that haven't even been born yet are following Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you keep that command right. if you're delegating the education of your children for 12 years to, uh, at best, secular government? Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, you might say, well, I've seen some people that have made it through the 11 or 12 years of public mm -hmm. schooling and turned out okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen some people play Russian roulette and not blow their brains out, but right. let's not play Russian roulette with right. your kids' souls right. Right. <laughs> and your grandchildren's future. Right. So you're and looking for... Uh, homeschooling uh, laws, you know, mm -hmm. and I found that in a lot of countries like Greece, um, you know, Germany, and just many, many, many countries, homeschooling is flat out illegal. Right. Which for me... Most I mean, countries. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was horrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that crossed most countries off the list for me. Right. But I looked and I was like, oh, of course homeschooling is legal in America, but I was already in America. So I was looking at other countries mm -hmm. and I was, oh, Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, homeschooling has been legal in Russia for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem. And then I started looking at other things such as, uh, you know, this, this fiction of homosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, that Adam and Steve can get together and mm -hmm. be a family. And... I found a number of countries where that's not permitted, that's mm -hmm. not legal, it's not done. Um, but then in a number of those countries, homeschooling is illegal. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, sure. it's like you do the Venn diagram yeah. idea and see where does it overlap. There's not that many countries. It really narrows it down. If, you're, mm -hmm. if you say, I want homeschooling to be legal mm -hmm. and I want there to be absolutely no hint of homosexual marriage or mm -hmm. civil unions... Uh, that doesn't leave you with many options. Mm -hmm. And one of the options was Russia. Mm -hmm. And then a third thing on top of that, um, you know, let's say we went to some small African country. Mm -hmm. Let's say we went to Paraguay or something like this. At some point, if the American, let's say they find oil there, mm -hmm. well, the American military is going to show up and mm -hmm. they're going to free them from their oppressive <laughs> government. Right, and right. then you're going to have a military base there. And... Most countries on earth, they can't defend themselves if, mm -hmm. if the American military shows up. Russia, on the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, from what I can tell, Russian mili the Russian military has actually better technology than America does, even though they're on a fraction of the budget. And, you know, Russia's not out trying to conquer the world, but, you know, <laughs> if, if you try to attack Russia, mm -hmm. good luck. Right. You know, I don't even think America's that stupid. Yeah. 
You're almost that stupid, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and so I just thought, not only is this a place where we could homeschool, not mm -hmm. only is it a place where they don't have civil unions, they don't have gay marriage, but I don't think the American military is going to come ruin the country either. You know, mm -hmm. They tried all these sanctions in 2014, and all it did is it helped Russia's agriculture mm -hmm. economy boom so that now Russia is exporting more wheat to the world every year than America mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So... I, I just felt like as far as being safe, you know, being actually protected by mm -hmm. the military, that Russia would be a good place to go. Mm -hmm. And so these are the different things that I played with just in my mind. And then finally, the straw that broke the camel's back, the trigger. Um, I'd already been thinking about all these things, but in the summer of 2015, mm -hmm. whenever you had Obergefell versus Hodges, mm -hmm. and the United States Supreme Court, so we're at the federal level, the highest court in the land said doesn't matter where you are in the United States you must you will be forced mm -hmm. to have gay marriage mm -hmm. so not just California right. not just New York not right. just Chicago but in Kansas you mm -hmm. will have gay marriage in Iowa in Idaho you mm -hmm. will have gay marriage in Alabama and Texas you will right. have gay marriage and I just said okay Sodom and Gomorrah used to be a couple of cities now it's a continent mm -hmm. And I don't want to be here when the fire falls. Mm -hmm. And so if America repents, then praise God. But uh, if America doesn't repent, mm -hmm. um, was, it Bill, I forget, was it Billy Graham or who was it that said, if, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think God has to apologize because God doesn't do anything <laughs> yeah. wrong. So yeah. if America doesn't repent something bad's going to happen mm -hmm. and I don't really want my children and grandchildren to be there whenever that happens, whatever that is. Right. Right. And so that was the trigger. I'd already been thinking, but that was the trigger when I said, okay, we're getting our Russian visas and, mm -hmm. and, and we're moving. Right. So six years later um, from that, you, yeah. know, you guys are still here in Russia. Mm -hmm. You uh, established residency, got your basically like the Russian version of the green card, the yeah. long-term residency uh, permission to live here. And then you got your citizenship yet you have not got your really close so, oh, right there <laughs> so my 18 year old i have eight kids uh, right. and my 18 year old daughter kimberly uh she's just like a like a natural polyglot mm -hmm. she over the past few years she's gotten fluent not only in russian but also portuguese mm -hmm. you know she just she <laughs> right. loves languages uh she's fluent in three and she's you know studying like ancient greek and hebrew and mm -hmm. and so she's fluent in russian mm -hmm. uh better you know better at it than i am and so she went and, and took that test that mm -hmm. they, they give saying, all right, if you can stand before this board of, of people and prove to us that you are like native fluent speaker of Russian, uh, then they give you the special certificate. Mm -hmm. And then with your green card, so to mm -hmm. speak, and the certificate, you can apply for citizenship. Mm -hmm. And so this summer, my 18-year-old daughter, or May, my, this May, my 18-year-old daughter applied for citizenship. She got it in August. Mm -hmm. And so now she has a red passport. She's a Russian citizen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that opens a door for the rest of us in that because now I have a daughter who is a Russian citizen. Now I can apply with all of my minor children, which would be her siblings, right. and say, okay, you know, can we be Russian citizens? Right. So my prayer, my hope is that, you know, by January or February, which is, you know, like three months from now, mm -hmm. that all of us, you know, that will be Russian citizens. Right. Right. So... Six years, you were living, living here, learning the language, you know, really on that, the, the track to getting the citizenship, almost there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, taking into consideration that the, the three things, kind of like the top three things that you were thinking about when you mm -hmm. chose Russia was, you wanted a place where you, where you felt that home and education was going to be safe. Yeah. You wanted a place where the whole LGBTQYX, you know, <laughs> XYZ, Alphabet whatever, yeah. <laughs> policy that seems to be just flooding the West. Uh, a place that was safe from that, right. you know, uh, a place that was militarily safe from the mm -hmm. American Empire. Uh, now, having been able to live here mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of seeing things from the other side, like Russia is number one uh, abortion capital of the world per capital, per mm -hmm. abortions per woman. Uh, Russia does recognize civil unions, not between men and women, or not between men and men, but, you know, 
no fault marriage, let alone no fault divorce, no fault marriage. Like they actually legally recognize just two people living together as a as a union. So it's you know yeah. legalized fornication. You know, right? Uh, Russia is kind of like common law marriage. Common law marriage, except idea. for it's it's actually codified. Right. And I understand. Um, you know, it's recognized by law. Right. And Russia has the the terrible distinction of being the child pornography uh, capital of the world, both in production and consumption. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, like the last year, they've really been tightening the screws. Which is good to see. On on homeschooling. They've been really making it harder for, for home education. Like we've lost in the last three years a lot of the rights we used to have as home educators. Have you gotten to the place where you like thinking, mm, maybe that was a bad decision? Or you really still feel like with all the alternatives out there, this is still the place to be? I think it's still the place to be. I think, I mean... You know, from day one, I knew this wasn't paradise. This isn't mm -hmm. like the suburb of heaven. If you come to Russia, all your problems will go away. <laughs> Everything's wonderful. I actually, before we moved here, I told my family, I said, this is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. In fact, it wasn't six years ago. It was five because mm -hmm. 2015, this happened with mm -hmm. the gay marriage right. law. And then over that next year, year and a half, I'm researching. I'm flying back and forth to Russia. I'm visiting different places, talking to people. Um... I wanted to do my homework before we actually moved here. So we mm -hmm. actually moved here uh, just short of five years ago. Mm, okay. But yeah, before we moved here, I told my wife and kids, I said, I think this is going to be hard, mm -hmm. but good. Right. You know, because a lot of times the best path to take is not the easy one. Right. You know, the easiest thing would just be to stay in America and keep doing what we were doing. Sure. And I said, I think this is going to be very difficult. Uh, I know it's not perfect. There's going to be troubles. There's going to be challenges. But I think this is the right thing to do. Um, you know, abortion, for example, um, on the one hand, yes, there's a horrific abortion problem, mm -hmm. but you don't just look at the problem. You look at the whole picture. So mm -hmm. America has had legalized abortion since 1973. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just short of what, 50 years, uh, Russia started in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. You know, so Russia has ha been having to deal with abortion as this great sin for a hundred years now, right. which means in many homes you have three generations of people, you know, where grandma got an abortion, daughter got an abortion, granddaughter got, you know, and uh, it's just, it's, you know, it's normal, it's fine. And yet even with that, um, you know, over the past 30 years, you've had a real movement within the Orthodox Church in Russia to very loudly and publicly... Uh, say we need to get rid of abortion mm -hmm. and so um, the problem had gotten so much more deeply ingrained you know if you rewind to like the 70s there were more abortions than there were births right. it was right. just mind-bogglingly horrible mm -hmm. i mean one yeah. one is mind-bogglingly horrible but this was you know exponentially when you were in the mid 80s you had something like 13 abortions per woman exactly <laughs> it's just uh, like, yeah, with numbers I can't even can't comprehend. Even comprehend. Yeah, that's right. And so you look at the stats and you, and you look at Russia and you say, this is how far it fell. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get in a really deep pit, even if you start climbing out of it, <laughs> you know, you can climb yeah. and climb and climb and climb. And, and somebody looks at you and says, man, you're deep in the, in the ground mm -hmm. in a hole and you're covered in mud. You're filthy. You know, what are you doing there? Are you, and, right. But then you point and you're like, oh, but look, I'm 50 feet closer to the surface than I was. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to dig myself out of this thing. Right. That's how I see Russia, because if you look at, you know, like a graph, it, it was horrific mm -hmm. in the 70s and the 80s. It's still horrific today, but it's drastically reduced. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the number, you know, and the percentage of abortions has drastically, drastically reduced mm -hmm. over the past couple decades. So since communism fell, since the church has grown and grown and grown and has become more, you know, out there in the public and allowed to spread its mm -hmm. message, it has an effect. Mm -hmm. And it's not just preaching. I mean, there are Orthodox uh, Christians all over Russia that have opened up what Americans would call crisis pregnancy centers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, women are having to, you know, get ultrasounds mm -hmm. before they choose to have an abortion, mm -hmm. which in a number of cases, they see the baby on the screen and say, sure. huh, that's a real baby. It's not just a clump of cells. I think mm -hmm. I'm. I think I'm going to keep the baby. Right. Now, some people don't. Some people see it and they still commit right. murder anyway. But uh, the church is really fighting it hard. Christians mm -hmm. are taking it seriously, and the numbers are dropping. Mm -hmm. And so I look at the trend and I say, first of all, Russia fell so much farther than mm -hmm. a lot of other countries did. 
and now there's been a major amount of climbing out. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now let's keep that up. Let's keep, keep going. Keep, yeah, let's yeah, keep going. Let's keep. Yeah. We're doing better now. Let's keep doing better, mm -hmm. and let's get rid of abortion. You know, let's. True. I'm not going to be happy until it's illegal. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which right. Is, we're not anywhere near that right now. Right. But I see a great improvement over where Russia was even 20 years ago mm -hmm. on that. So. I'm sad anytime there's even one abortion, but I'm encouraged that mm. it's being reduced. It's, it's right. you know, it's being fought against. Mm. Um, you know, homeschooling. You know, there's always a fight. There always, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, you rewind to what was it, the 50s and 60s. Um, America was having to battle even just to right. have homeschooling at all. 70s, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I just look at the thousands of parents that are homeschooling in Russia and have been homeschooling in Russia. Uh, you know, we have Which kind is of, still a fraction of the size of the community of the homeschooling community. Oh, in the absolutely. States. I mean, and, and with COVID, I mean, in the states, it's actually skyrocketed yeah. the number of homeschoolers. There was like two million, now we're like six million. Right. So it's just mind-boggling. But I, you know, with every, as, as you know, with every, you know, even in farming, with every blessing, there comes True. all these other challenges. You know, in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, okay. Um, at what point does homeschooling become so big, so mainstream, that the American government decides, okay, we've really got to regulate mm -hmm. this. We've got to make sure that, okay, all you people want to be doing homeschooling, that's great, but okay, uh, have you done your, you know, 30 hours of LGBT sensitivity training <laughs> and stuff? You know, I hope not. I yeah, don't want yeah, that. Yeah, I don't wish yeah. that on anybody. Sure. But uh, I don't, but you, but you I don't kind think of, it's far-fetched. You far kind of wonder, right? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah and so yeah. it's like, is this, on the one hand, I'm glad that more people are mm -hmm. homeschooling. On the other hand, I'm like, Okay, but now they're looking at us even. <laughs> you right. know, they're, 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 um, but just like there's the homeschool, um, what is it, HSLDA, you know, the Legal mm -hmm. Defense Association in America, there's the Russian equivalent of that right. here. You know, I've got the phone number of a lawyer who is an expert on homeschooling law in Russia, mm -hmm. and they have this same kind of foundation here in Russia. And if somebody from the government wanted to come mess with us because mm -hmm. we're homeschooling, I mean, I've got a hotline to the Russian expert I can call mm -hmm. who is going to just jump in and help fight against, you know, whatever these incursions right. are. So, of course, I don't like it in any country, Russia or America or anywhere else, that the government starts trying to put the screws and saying, oh, we're going to control this, we're going to control mm -hmm. that. Uh, I might be taking a bit of a risk here because you never know who's going to see stuff on the Internet, but I'll, I'll just say in my case... Uh, <laughs> You know, you could quote it better than I can, but what's that Saltikov Shedrin quote? <laughs> um, the, the severity of our laws are lightened by the non-necessity of their of, of being following followed. them. <laughs> so just let me just give you an example, just a little anecdote, yeah, a snapshot. Yeah, yeah. So I have eight kids. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny. People nearby were asking, so you know, what about uh, schooling? And you know, does the government approve of your curriculum? And blah 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 blah. And I said, uh, my wife and I don't really think it's important what the government thinks about our curriculum, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so we get, we finally got our green card, as you said, mm -hmm. the legal residency in Russia. And so this has been, I don't know, a couple of years ago that we got the final vidna mm -hmm. as they right, call it. Right. And once that happened, we were, had that green card and we're registered in this local community, uh, Sure enough, local officials show up and like, well, you know, you've got all these kids, you're registered as residents here, so, you know, what's right. their schooling going to be? Are they going to be in our schools, or what are you going to do? And so I met with them one time, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, we're going to homeschool our children, uh, so, you know, we're not going to need your services. Right. And, and so when you do that, by Russian law, they had all these little papers that I'm supposed to sign. Right. And so on each one of them, you put the kid's name, you know, everything written in Russian, but you put the kid's name. And then you're supposed to put, you know, since uh, the local school is not going to be responsible for their education, you're supposed to write down the name of the, the legal entity, which mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. you know, so you're supposed to be registered either with that school mm -hmm. and then they oversee your homeschooling sure. or you, uh, you know, you pay like a hundred bucks a year and there's this uh, homeschooling association in Moscow that you can, Okay, this is the legal entity, and right. if I have to do that, I'll do it. I'll, I'll pay a hundred bucks sure. to them so that I'm on their list as in their school. Yep. And, you know, so that's a way to handle it, completely legal. But um, I decided not. I didn't even want to pay that hundred dollars right. to do that right. because these are my kids. I'm going to teach them, and it's really none of the government's business. Sure. And so, um, on this form, I filled it out. They handed me these forms. I put the kid's name, and then the spot, you know. I said, uh, American homeschool. Mm -hmm. 
know, our, our home school located in America. Mm -hmm. And then I signed it. And, sure. And then a day later, my phone rings. Mm -hmm. And I ignore it. You know, I see who it's from, and they sent this message, and mm -hmm. I ignore it. And they never showed up again. No. Nope. I thought, if they show up again, if they really press it, mm -hmm. then I'll pay the 100 bucks. I'll get on the list of this group. And, but my opinion is that most of the time, not always, most of the time, uh, it's not that the low-level bureaucrats really want to implement these stupid right. laws. Yeah. It's they don't want to be blamed. They don't want to get in trouble. If something goes wrong, right. or if there's a review or an audit or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's what it is. And yep. so, but if they, they feel like... They want to have like, plausible deniability. <laughs> yeah. But if they feel like they have some sort of a piece of paper yep. filled out, and then, well, the parent just filled it out wrong or did something mm -hmm. wrong, if there's some way that somebody other than them can be blamed... Yeah then they don't care. They, they weren't yep. looking for, we really want more foreigners in our public schools here. Sure. This is, you know, we really want to have more stuff on our plate to go manage how they're homeschooling. Right. They, they don't care. Right. They just don't want to get in trouble. And right. so in this particular situation, mm -hmm. I just kind of filled out the form in this way. They bugged me for a day or two and then they got tired of it and they left sure. it alone. And I haven't heard from them since. Right. And my, you know, my sincere wishes my sincere hope mm -hmm. is that when you guys actually do get full-fledged russian citizenship that that's the experience that you continue to have <laughs> so that you know we'll see how it turns out but let's you know maybe we'll meet in a few years and see how it goes we're being paged for for lunch so I'll okay. have two more quick questions sure. and, then we'll, and then we'll try to get it done and, okay. and just say the the, the 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 second last question that i had was you went into the, the ministry as an Orthodox priest, mm -hmm. already being still being in the States. And then mm -hmm. you, you transferred over to Russia. Right. The, church, the churches did their, you know, inner church thing and transferred you. And you're serving here in Russia. Um, part of, I, I've had several friends, um, actually relatives, friends who have converted to Russian or, or mm -hmm. Russian Orthodox, but Orthodoxy in the United States. And one of the things that they say is, uh, the, the sincerity and the, the price that was necessary to pay for the people who are Orthodox in America kind of puts a filter on at the door. Um, and, it, and you don't have, or it doesn't seem like they have very many nominal uh, Orthodox believers in the United States. The people who are really serious have come mm -hmm. very consciously to their faith, very, very serious. Um, and, and, and I see that the same effect in Russia, in the Protestant Church, sure. that people who are, are have come to Protestantism or come to Christianity in the Protestant kind of vein, the mm -hmm. Protestant tradition, are are very sincere because they've had to pay a price. They've had to turn their back to, mm -hmm. to some degree on their own culture, um, you know. And same sure. way, like Orthodox in the United States, it's it's that. Uh, when you came over to Russia, did did were you disappointed with the state of the the the, the church in Russia? Or, or was that something that you saw, like, you know, the sincerity level de decreased? Or, or what were your thoughts about, about that as you moved over here? Well, the, the kind of the way I approached it, you know, I, I had a f fair understanding of the lay of the land, both in Protestantism, mm -hmm. because I was, you know, I've been a pastor, a Protestant pastor. Mm -hmm. My dad had been a Protestant, you know, missionary slash pastor. And then, you know, I became Orthodox and an Orthodox minister. So I got to see both in America. And just across the whole swath um, of, of these different confessions, I saw that you really have just a continuum. You have, whether it's Baptist, Lutheran, Orthodox, Catholic, you have people that are dead serious. Mm -hmm. You know, they know their faith. Um, they want to follow it to the T. They study. They worship. They teach their children. You know, they're all in. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're at the doors. Every time the church doors open and if the pastor's, you know, painting, they, they sit there and they watch him, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're there. And then you have the people that, you know, their closest attachment to Christianity is that maybe they have a cross necklace mm -hmm. and maybe every other Easter they show up for mm -hmm. an Easter sunrise service or something. Right. And then that's it. WWJD bracelet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, you know, maybe a picture of Christ in their living room or mm -hmm. something. And that's, other than that, you can't tell any difference in the way they live and the way the pagans live. And and so I saw that in America in many contexts, mm -hmm. you know, both Protestant and Orthodox. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have the continuum there, even among the Orthodox, because, yes, you have a lot of converts to Orthodoxy that are very serious. Mm -hmm. But even in America, you have millions of Greek immigrants, Russian immigrants, mm -hmm. Serbian immigrants 
that brought their nominalism with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And some of them are serious. Don't you know? I don't want to say all Greeks or all Russians mm -hmm. are bad. Some of them are very serious, and some of them are just very not serious. Mm -hmm. That they looked at the Orthodox Church as a social club. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is just where Greeks get together. This is mm -hmm. where Russians get together. This is where people from the Middle East get together. And you find both mm -hmm. in America, and I got to see both. And so what I tell everybody is that that same continuum that I saw in America is also in Russia. Mm -hmm. The only difference is instead of one or two million Orthodox like you have in America, here it's like 80 or 100 million. Mm -hmm. And so you know, you've got tens of millions of nominal. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, it's a small percentage of really serious devout, but even that small percentage is still millions of people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it was St. Basil the Great back in the 4th century that said, you've got this field mm -hmm. you know, it's a nice farming analogy you got this whole field and this bee flies out and it flies over this whole field and comes back and it gives you a report and it says man just flowers everywhere you know got mm -hmm. tons of nectar we're making tons of honey this is great and then you let a fly go mm -hmm. the fly flies over the same field and lands on every turd every cow patty you know mm -hmm. <laughs> comes back and says it's all crap <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then you know saint base of the great said be the bee you know <laughs> right yeah. be the bee yeah and so when people want to move here i say absolutely you're going to run into atheists you're mm -hmm. going to run into muslims you're going to run into buddhists you're going to run into tons of people that say they're orthodox and you're not going to tell any difference between them and the muslims and the buddhists and the atheists mm -hmm. <laughs> um but if you be the bee you know, if you're looking for the good, if you're looking for the flowers and the nectar, I said there are millions of actual, serious, devout Orthodox who love Christ, who go to church because they believe in Christ, mm -hmm. who are raising their children to believe in Christ. And and even there, there's a continuum. As you know, there's people that are serious, and then there's people that are really serious, you know, right. and the same thing. But if you want to find Orthodox Christians in Russia who were born and raised here and who truly love Christ, there are a lot of them. Yeah. There are a lot of them to be found if that's what you're looking for. And since it's not possible for me to hang out with 140 million people, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I pick the ones I want my family to be around, sure. there's plenty of good Christians here, You know, plenty of available Christian communities for us to be in where we're with other Orthodox Christians, people who are going to liturgy, people who are, you know, who are learning about the scriptures, people who actually care about the faith. Yep. Yeah. And so that's how I approach it. I just say, no matter what country you live in, you're going to have your nominals. You're going to have your, you know, kind of yep. in the middle. And then you're going to have your really serious ones. And you just have to make a decision, you know, am I going to seek out the flowers or am I, am I going to seek sure. out the turds? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that brings us to our last question. And that's, you are really active in this kind of interesting project that's happening over there north of Moscow. Mm -hmm the American village in Russia. <laughs> so yeah. I first heard about it from Tim Kirby. He came out here and did a, did a oh, yeah. video with us here on the farm. And now you're here. It's like, okay, this is this project where you've kind of gotten some, uh, you know, approval of the mm -hmm. local government and even the, the Moscow government to do this project of bringing in mm -hmm. people from America who, you know, value Russia, value Russian culture, value Russian heritage and want mm -hmm. to actually immigrate to Russia, to this particular spot, give us the, you know, five minute, you know, uh, cooler sp pitch on sure. what that is, why somebody might be interested in it, mm -hmm. um, and how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, you know, many people, I, uh, before we moved to Russia, I created this little Facebook group, you know, moving to Russia. And, and since then, um, you know, people get in touch with me on email on telegram on what's, you know, all the different mm -hmm. spots, but just started out as a handful of people chit-chatting about, hey, who would be interested in moving to Russia? And then it you know, it grew to thousands of people that not all of them are planning to move, mm -hmm. but thousands who are interested. Mm -hmm. because, uh, either interested because they're curious, why would somebody want to do that? Mm -hmm. All the way up to people that say, look, I'm ready to pack my bags and sell my house now. Right. How do I do it? Yeah. How do I move to Russia now? And as you yourself figured out, even once you've made that decision, I'm going to move to Russia uh, the bureaucracy behind <laughs> actually making that happen, yeah. it's not a simple thing. Right. And and so my wife, my family and I, we went through a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy and, you know, challenges, mm -hmm. <laughs> to put it nicely, for years to finally say, hey, you know, we're permanent residents here. Uh, we're on the verge of all of us having citizenship. Everything is working out. Um, 
Now, what did we learn from that? So that the next family that moves here doesn't have to go through what we went through mm -hmm. to figure it all out. Because it's overwhelming. It can feel overwhelming. Yep. And uh, it's a lot easier if they can show up and we can just tell them, okay, there's a lot of things you have to do, but here they are. Mm -hmm. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you're in. Right. Okay. You know, you can eat an elephant if it's one bite at a time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and so that's how we've been helping people. And so it started as a, as a trickle. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, it was just everybody thinking we were nuts, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some friends of ours from Brazil mm -hmm. moved moved to Rostov the Great, you know, about mm -hmm. three hours north of Moscow. And then, you know, recently there's another uh, four families that have come, um, or four or five. So one from um, uh, Scotland, um, another one from uh, Belgium, and then three from America that have, for various reasons, mm -hmm. have come and are in the Rostov, Paraslavl, Yaroslavl, mm -hmm. that area. And, and now it's, and, and you know, we've gone, you know, I wrote a letter to President Putin. Uh, we've brought it up to Russia through Nichespa, which is a, mm -hmm. a government group that helps people that are moving to Russia. And we just said, look, there's actually a lot of Americans and Canadians and people from England and Australia that are wanting to come to Russia. They see mm -hmm. the value, they see the, they see the available Christian culture that's here. Uh, they like the fact that, that homeschooling's allowed here, uh, but they don't want to do it alone. They don't just want to do what I did and just bring your family and figure it out. And yeah, figure it out. <laughs> like like you did with yeah. your family. Yeah. That's just so overwhelming that they want somebody to help them. Right. So we want to go where, uh, you know, I can, like, like somebody that comes and says, I want to go where Justice Walker already lives so he can help me through the process. Mm -hmm. Or somebody that comes and says, I want Father Joseph to help us through this process. So we want to live near where he is so he can help mm -hmm. us through this. Uh, the idea was hatched that what if we had like an American village? You know, Russia mm -hmm. has tons of land. Right. Tons of available locations for, for people to do this. Land is cheap here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the idea was hatched to have like a little American village. Mm -hmm. Idea being that all these people that are wanting to come from the West that speak English and they want to come to Russia Everybody doesn't have to figure it out themselves. They right. can all live near each other. Now, of course, they still need to learn Russian. They still need to do all the paperwork. They still need to get integrated in the local community. And and so, you know, we don't want a ghetto. Right. <laughs> don't want an American ghetto. But to help each other, you know, sure. to bear one another's burdens, as mm -hmm. you read about in Galatians. Uh, just to be there for each other, to help each other through the process, to lend moral support, to pray for each other. Uh, drive each other to meetings to you know mm -hmm. do all the paperwork for immigration and this really appealed not only to the people that are coming but also to the government so mm -hmm. the russian government has kind of given their blessing to this they uh, you know, actually had a meeting with uh you know the governor of the state of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the oblast mm -hmm. uh Vyaroslav, and the people that work with him and and so basically, you know, there's a lot of people now, like just within the next six months, I'm expecting about another dozen families mm. to show up to the area, Wow! which it's, you know, now the trickles turn into kind of a stream mm -hmm. and, and, or to use a different analogy and the snowballs starting to roll down yeah. hill, but you know, <laughs> you know what happens yeah, when that happens. Yeah. And so I, I really see something big, you know, we're on the verge happening here and, and now we're just trying to get all the, you know, paperwork done, mm -hmm. visas, invitations, all these different yeah. things. And so people that want to do this, um, you know, they're just, they're basically getting on the website or they're getting on email or they're getting on Telegram mm -hmm. and saying, hey, me too. You know, tell me more, yeah. tell me more. And so I don't know what the best way to do it is, you know, you want to put up on the screen like an email address or something. I'll just put it just, in the, we'll put it in the, uh, in the description of the video on the video here. Uh, just if you email would be best, right? So your email address will be down there and you know, people, if they're interested in, uh, getting a hold of you to <laughs> make yeah. the move, then they can just send you an email. I mean, honestly, you know, there's the the uh, Russian-faith.com. Mm -hmm. It's one of the websites where I'm an editor. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Russian-faith.com mm -hmm. and you hunt around on there for the email address for the editor, mm -hmm. uh, that email will go right to me. All right. Well, so, we'll put the email And we can the, also put it in your, you in know, put it on there. But yep. just if somebody's listening to this while they're driving, they'll hear that and they can jot yep. it down. That's, we go. that's one of the ways to find me. So. All right. Well, thanks so much. This has been very good. We've spent... 
quite a few hours before this talking and then now and we could probably talk for a few more hours it'd be but, great <laughs> gotta get i want to invite so. you i know you do some traveling if you come like to the moscow area and you want to kind of get a little tour of the golden ring come see rostov all right uh, <laughs> yeah i invite you and however much you know, your family you want to bring you know come stay at our house um you know, i'd love to introduce you to the family all right and you know give you a tour of the area and maybe i'll interview you and put you on my youtube all right something. sounds so. like a plan all right well let's get to lunch and uh god all bless right. and bye, bye for now everyone and if you're interested in the project give uh father joseph a little shoot him an email and until next time god bless all right thanks